Thanks a lot for this introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Andriy Shevchenko. I'm a, a, a reporter at Coin Telegraph, and uh, I'm I'm joined here by in this panel by Chad McCaleb from uh, who is the architect of uh, Stellar, and uh, John Devados from Neo Global Development, and uh, Jack Liu, who is uh, the CEO and founder of One Chain. So. Uh, the panel is going to talk about inter interoperability, which is a pretty complex word to pronounce, I guess. And um, so, uh, first of all, I wanted to touch upon uh, Jack, uh, or rather, uh, John and Jad specifically, uh, because, of course, we kind of like one chain from the very beginning, it was always about uh, interoperability, right? While um, Stellar and Neo, are, from what I've seen, they have kind of um, expanded into this recently. So my question is, uh, let's touch, let's go to Jad first. Uh, my question is, what made you choose interoperability as the future direction of Stellar and what benefits do you see from it? Uh, yeah, I mean, Stellar was built from the get-go to provide interoperability, um, not particularly between uh, different crypto networks, but between networks in general, between payment networks. I mean, if you look at the payment landscape today, it's very fractured and doesn't work like the internet does. And Stellar, from the beginning, was an attempt to, or is an attempt to uh, unify all that, to make kind of a universal way to pay anyone, hold any kind of currency, whether it's fiat or crypto, and be able to pay anyone else in the world in whatever currency they want to receive. It could be a different thing, right? So these things should all interoperate and that'll make a much more seamless system and that's what Stellar's built to do. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, John? Uh, yeah, thank you. First of all, it's a privilege to be here at Blockdown. So I want to thank you and the team for the opportunity and the time. Uh, I'll just say one thing. I mean, look, uh, any, any chain or any platform that says they are not committed to interoperability has no clue how the world works. Uh, and so for us from the very beginning, it's been, look, it is about a heterogeneous world. And whether you like it or not, you have to work with other systems. There is one distinction I wanna make, Andre. I think people often get this confused. Uh, blockchain platforms on one side are technology platforms. On the other side, they are economic platforms. And so we use the term interoperability as an industry very broadly. And I think it has the risk of confusing people. And I'm happy to follow up and discuss what I mean by these two dimensions and why we should go to the next level of detail to really discuss what interop means. Yeah, I guess that actually follows well into the next question, which is, um, how do you see interoperability happening? Like uh, kind of the general idea of it is that you uh, bring a token from one blockchain to another blockchain, but obviously there are like more uh, advanced cases of that. So for example, having smart contracts interact, interact cross chain. So I wanted to go to you first and then Jack so that we can kind of uh, pitch everyone's opinion in. So what do you think about that? Like what is interoperability? Yeah, so thank you again. It's a very good segue. Uh, for me, like I said, uh, I see two perspectives, Andre, from a technology platform perspective and then from an economic platform perspective. So first, when we see the technology platform, very clearly, that is what you might call protocol interoperability. How do different protocols work together, which we have to, right, whether we like it or not. The second thing is what you might call code uh, our smart contract interoperability. How do we ensure we have ways and means to do things like porting and so on and so forth, right? On the other side, as an economic platform, as you mentioned, uh, very clearly there is what you might call token interoperability. And how do we ensure that the assets themselves uh, are, are interoperable, whether they be wrapping a token and or so on and so forth. But there's also the underlying ledger interoperability how do we ensure that at the ledger level, we have ways and means to reconcile, to settle? And those to me are the four key vantage points in terms of how we and I think about interoperability. Yeah, for sure. Jack, what are your thoughts on this? Like, what do you think uh, interoperability should be? Yes, certainly, uh, it's very challenging um, to make all these uh, uh, you know, siloed blockchains uh, talk to each other. Uh, I, I think um, 
And from my perspective, um, you know, uh, you know, in one blockchain, you can do certain operation, and all these the operation can be transferred or or can be operated by uh, somebody on a different chain, and also not only information but also uh, the assets can be flown from one one chain to another, and on on top of that, uh, we can build build cross chain applications, right? Uh, I often use uh, the internet as an example, but uh, certainly a uh, blockchain world is a lot more complex um, because it's you is doing the ledger. Right? We are recording the records and you know immutable records. And uh, in order for a decentralized world to recognize a separate decentralized world uh, without identifying itself, it's very very difficult. Right. So. Um, so for all these different decentralized wor worlds uh, to talk to each other and recognize each other and make it in interoperable, uh, th that's what I'm seeing, uh, the world we are building. For sure. And Jed, I guess uh, you kind of mentioned this in the previous answer that uh, Stellar's focus is on transferring value. So do you think that for Stellar, interoperability is mostly about, um, I guess, the tokens, the, the representations of value? Or do you see um, more advanced interactions uh, going on from Stellar as well? Uh, yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're focused on mainly, um, we take a really user-centric approach. And, and I think what people actually care about is value, not some like abstract token. And so like they don't really care whether the value is represented in one thing or another. Actually, they do care. They want it represented in the thing that they're used to, and so we, we take that approach where we 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 make it interoperable at that level where um, the kind of currency someone's used to holding they can still hold, and then at the end of the day, someone that they're sending to can hold whatever they're used to holding, right? And so I think that's what important. It's what, like I think often uh, these projects can get a little bit nasal gazing, gazing, where people don't actually care about these tokens, like actual people outside the crypto circle. They they want to just be able to use normal money, and they want to be able to send value around that way. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, that definitely opens the floor to st the rise of stable coins right now. So uh, actually here we can kind of follow up into Tether, which as we all know, kind of recently began uh, expanding into multiple blockchains. So of course it started on Bitcoin, now it's on Ethereum. And, you know, there is not really a huge amount of interoperability between those various types of tokens. But uh, ultimately, do you think that um, kind of these stable coins are... Um, the most important thing like uh, to drive adoption of interoperability like to have these stable coins exist on all blockchains so that um, value could be transferred easily between the various chains and this is to jed and then to all the okay. others i guess uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's one that's one layer of it. I mean, I, I mean, as John pointed out, there's like lots of different aspects to interoperability, and and certainly uh, having um, a standard token that can kind of move between chains in that in the way that Tether can now um, is one aspect of it for sure. Yeah. So. John, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I would concur with Jed. I mean, for me, the stable coins are like uh, XML of the previous generation. It provides an interchangeable format of value, I think, as Jed said, across systems. However, it's only, you know, one, one layer, one level. And there is a lot more that goes on behind the scenes which the user may or may not care about, but which we, as platform guys, we have to ensure works flawlessly. For sure. And Jack, what do you think about stable coins in general and using them? Yeah, uh, I think stable coins is quite important for the current stage uh, and measures the value of the other assets. And the Wenching has integrated with uh, multiple uh, stable, stable coins, including USDT, USDC and many others, and also uh, recently a Euro a status uh, uh, on, on Ethereum uh, as well. So we have multiple uh, stable coins uh, on one chain so far, and it is important for our users to be able to, um, you know, exchange them uh, in the in the cross chain DAX, and they can, uh, you know, change it with with the uh, stable coin directly. Uh, what I think is uh, stablecoin is the, the bridge to the, the 
um, the traditional financial world, even though that it's kind of centralized and uh, and uh, has some risks behind it. And uh, but uh, we certainly see the needs. Uh, it's a very very strong demand for it in in the blockchain world because uh, a lot of trading or a lot, a lot of value are being carried by the stable coins. Um, and um, I think it's a current bridge to the traditional fund, including, of course, other assets can be moved up onto uh, onto blockchain uh, little by little. But uh, what I see today, uh, the stable coins really are very, very important uh, for the current stage. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, the next thing, like uh, the panel uh, will mention the issues of interoperability. And the one thing that I feel is kind of the biggest problem that we're facing right now is that, you know, the, how um, there are multiple standards for a certain thing, right? So uh, I don't know if you've seen this uh, pain from XKCD, which uh, basically says, uh, you know, there's the initial pain with 15 standards for a particular thing. And then there are a few guys who say, okay, let's, uh, there, these are too many, let's just create our own standards to rule them all. And the next pain is like, okay, now there are 16 uh, competing standards. So my question is, how can you reconcile this? Because obviously uh, there are a lot of projects dealing with interoperability, but they're not really interoperable with the, with each other. So uh, do you think that this is uh, part of the competition with um, between these projects, or do you think that eventually they will kind of just join together into one big whole? And I'm going to ask this to Jack and then to all the others. Well, uh, certainly uh, we try to, um, and work with a any projects or any organ organizations. In, in the beginning, we organized this uh, alliance, uh, interoperability alliance. And uh, we tried to work with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hyperledger and uh, Ethereum, um, you know, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance um, and um, many others to, to come up with uh, uh, common standards. And I, I think uh, uh, one change leading uh, or co-chairing the, the role in the uh, interoperability task force in the EEA, and we, we, we are making progress uh, every day. Uh, but certainly I see that it's pretty challenging to, for any single party to come, come up with this standard. We can easily list wh whatever we want to do, you know, post it on the website, but it, it, it doesn't matter right, if nobody's adopting it, right? So uh, I'm very eager to work with anybody, right? Whoever's in, in this space, so let's sit down and say, well, let's talk about, uh, you know, what we need to do. What's the end game here, right? I know that it's long, long road. So, uh, so during the meantime, so that's why we, we, are, we are being re realistic. So we try to create a, a WAN, <laughs> a wide area network first, right? instead of in internet or blockchains. So we take a like stage approach. So first we want to connect uh, quite a few uh, blockchains to create a, a, a WAN or, and a bigger, bigger WAN, right? So um, that's the, the approach we're taking, but we are so eager to work with anybody. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for this answer. Um, John, what do you think? Um, are there too many interoperability projects right now? And uh, how can we kind of, make them work together. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll say two things, Andre. First of all, uh, any project uh, that comes along and touts itself as the answer or the solution for interoperability, to me, that's just nonsensical. You know, what the, what, not to name names, but you know, the Cosmos story, the polka dot, it just makes no sense to me. There is no silver bullet. The second thing is the way interoperability works in the industry is via standards. And standards are emergent. They are created by multiple parties coming together over time to build, to evangelize, and to adapt. And so the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is essentially dead as of right now, which is a flawed idea to have a single chain drive standards. Two weeks ago, we launched the Interwork Alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, founding members, Microsoft, Accenture, IBM, NEO, and many others. Uh, and so we believe, we expect that, you know, an initiative like this can actually lead to the organic emergence of industry standards. And over time, chains and platforms will adopt them. 
which is how in the past, you know, we have seen this happen. And I think that's the most effective way in practical terms. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I guess that does make sense because uh, it is really a different one interoperable project that connects them all. So <laughs> it yes, really it make makes no sense to me, whatever. I mean, it's just pure marketing bullshit, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, Jet, what do you think about this? Like, uh, do you think that uh, it's going to eventually lead to just standards between multiple projects or maybe one of them will eventually win? Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about interoperability between different blockchains, I, I think, I think John's right is that eventually some standard will emerge and it won't be some third chain. It, it, it will be like just a way that these different, uh, like chains communicate with each other. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much to say anything on that, but yeah, it's definitely we're definitely in this period where it seems a little premature for it because none of these chains on their own are that attractive to people. So why do you need to talk between them? Because like no one's using either one, so there's not really any point to talk between them. But but uh, but we'll get there. So yeah, maybe it's good to start talking about it now. Yeah, in topic because uh, obviously. A lot of usage right now we see is uh, actually focused on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Tether, essentially, in terms of transferring value and uh, having kind of some pretty well-defined use cases. So do you think that in light of this, um, the industry is really moving towards having many different participants that are then interoperable? Or do you think that perhaps it's going to be a winner-takes-all uh, approach? So I'm going to ask it to Jed again, and then we move into the others. So I, I think I think uh, the world of like cryptocurrency gets kind of lumped in this large bucket, but really there's lots of different use cases and lots of different niches that things are, are doing. And I, so I don't think there'll be like one blockchain and all the other ones will fall away. Like they're, they're all solving different problems and, 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 uh, and independently useful, right? So I do think that there'll be, you know, probably one in each little vertical, I guess, but, but in, in those things, there's probably a need for interoperability between those. Like if, if you're like supply chain chain needs to talk to your like, you know, world computing chain, like, like that, 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 that could be potentially possible or whatever. So, um, but, but there definitely won't be a single one in the future. I mean, there, there's just too many use cases and software doesn't work that way. You can't just, you can't solve everything with one, one, uh, program. Yeah, for sure. That makes, like, you know, there are definitely, I guess we're still early in the crypto space in general, so there aren't a whole lot of use cases for it. So uh, I don't know, for example, what do you think of DeFi? Um, I'm going to ask it to John. Um, so I guess uh, a lot of the use cases on Ethereum right now are related to DeFi, but ultimately I think it's not really a secret that uh, DeFi is mostly about crypto. So um, do you think that we're just still too early to have use cases that have kind of uh, impact on the real world, or um, is it just going to be like that for a while? That's a, that's a fantastic question, Andre. Thank you for asking. So I would say a couple of things. Firstly, yes, it is very early. I think uh, we haven't seen anything yet, right? I mean, this is just not even the, you know, the end of the first innings in terms of uh, analogy. So I think, you know, the next three, four, five years is gonna be phenomenal, right? Uh, the second thing in terms of DeFi, uh, yes, it makes a lot of sense to me because for me, crypto is an asset. Mm. And so if you buy that underlying assumption that crypto is an asset, assets are about leverage. And leverage naturally leads you to DeFi. And stable coins are a bridge to help us to enable leverage. So it's, it makes a lot of sense to me why we are there. And at this point, was it like a billion dollars, you know, I think under managed, you know, overall across DeFi ecosystem, this is nothing, right? We're gonna see trillions, right? Trillions in, a, in, in, in very short order. So yes, absolutely. I believe DeFi is very much on course. We're gonna see you know, for in innovation, you know, risk management, insurance, and so on and so forth. But uh, just the beginning, yeah, totally agree. Yeah, and uh, Jack, so do you think that uh, DeFi needs interoperability? Like, uh, Certainly, yeah, certainly. Um, that's what we're building the DeFi applications on one chain today. Right? We're building lending, and uh, we're building a prediction market. We're building uh, options, uh, and uh, people can buy those uh, assets or play in the in the DeFi or banking applications. Uh, we call it cross chain uh, DApps uh, with all kinds of different assets right? uh, from different chains. 
uh, as long as they are connected to one chain. Right? But we are bringing this uh, one step further. Uh, I, I think um, we want to uh, move the assets really in, on, into different chains. Uh, for example, uh, right now, you know, a lot of projects, so it's quite hot uh, on uh, Ethereum uh, that, uh, you know, quite a few uh, DeFi applications like uh, recently, uh, you know, uh, MakerDAO or Compound, they are attracting a lot of assets uh, from Bitcoin or many other uh, uh, chains, right? If you want a big, uh, you want Bitcoin, uh, is especially the the king of all the chains, uh, doesn't have all that all that many uh, use cases or DeFi uh, use cases. We need to ship those assets onto some uh, play one financial center, for example, in the early days in London, right? And, and uh, we we want ship those assets on onto this financial center, including um, you know. Uh, Bitcoin or e EOS or, or ETC or may maybe many other, uh, you know, uh, assets, right? So that they can participate in this uh, DeFi world, right? And uh, once we have multiple uh, financial centers in the future, right? Let's say tomorrow, NEO or Stella will become very, very hot, right? One chain will be able to connect to them and ship the ad other assets onto their chains, right? And uh, there will be many, many different economies and with harder economies, with, with higher interest rates, right? And you, if you can get a higher return, then uh, from the colder economy or the lower interest rate assets will, will be, the, be able to transfer to the other uh, economies. So that's what I, what I see in, in the future. So, and th that's why we are building the two-way bridges and direct bridges and build multiple, uh, uh, you know, bridges, connect all these different chains together so the assets can be, can be transferred into different chains. Yeah, for sure. And um, actually, I guess uh, this is kind of a, um, a thing about crypto in general is that uh, liquidity is quite localized. So even if we talk about centralized exchanges, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of communication between those. I mean, of course, there are arbitrage traders, but in general, like, for example, right now we're seeing the rise of prime brokers and uh, things like that. So that can be seen as uh, interoperable, like, uh, projects, but just on a centralized level. So actually, I wanted to ask John about this. So do you think that perhaps in the future, if uh, everything moves on chain, uh, every like trading, uh, the centralized exchanges really take off. Um, do you think that interoperability is going to be key to that? Or again, do you think that it's going to be just on one chain, uh, you know, like not with the project? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so to use an analogy, and of course, you know, analogies are all flawed in some sense, right? If you, but, but I'll go with one for now. Uh, if you look at the role the U.S. dollar plays as the world's currency, uh, and of course you have a whole host of abstractions, derivatives, and all kinds of super derivatives built on it, which drives the world's economic engine. Uh, you could argue in some sense perhaps uh, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum play that role in terms of DeFi. That's why you have a whole host of wrapping and efforts to, to create liquidity and so on. Uh, so yes, the short answer to your question is that I believe settlement will happen across a network of uh, ledgers, a network, systems of systems, Stellar and you know, Neo and OneChain and, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, there will not be one chain. Uh, and yes, in doing so, we will be able to create liquidity. And as Jed very eloquently said, uh, exchange of value. At the end of the day, that's what the user cares about. Now, we are the plumbers. Now, we build the tools and the infrastructure. We care about all of the details. But being able to create uh, exchange of value to enable this uh, is, the, is the game. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, speaking about, you know, wrapping tokens. So I wanted to ask Jed here. Um, on Ethereum, there are a few issues in general with trying to bring Bitcoin to that chain because uh, obviously Bitcoin doesn't support smart contracts. So it's uh, most of the solutions that we see right now are actually focused on custodians. 
which you know federated or uh, central completely centralized but they're still holding custody of the bitcoin while it's uh, moved to another chain so i wanted to ask you in terms of technical solutions do you think that it is possible to create uh, bridges to these kind of let's say legacy quote-unquote chains uh, which don't support these contracts and maybe are not really developed to be interoperable um i mean I, I don't know of a good way i mean we we do a similar thing where it's you know it's either yeah it's basically custody um uh when you want to have like you know uh, other tokens on stellar but um i mean potentially there probably is some way that someone hasn't really come up with or thought of yet that that you can do these mm -hmm. kind of things but yeah i don't know of a way so far i mean yeah, often like when you like dig into these like smart contracting solutions, they end up being not that much better than just custody. So um, I'm a little skeptical, but but um, maybe, yeah. Well, uh, Andrew, yeah. Well, uh, I don't know, uh, Jed, if you have looked at the uh, one chain solution. Uh, by the way, uh, Jed, we, we met uh, several years ago in, in China. Yeah, and I any, Anyway, yeah. Um, Wenchain has already uh, built a decentralized solution where we use SMP, SMPC, uh, uh, multi-party computation, and also the uh, threshold signature, right? Uh, we use this uh, kind of technology with, with a group of nodes we call Stallman nodes, and uh, they uh, hold the custody of the, of the Bitcoin. I say uh, these group of nodes will control a, a special locked account and um, uh, and uh, the bitcoins when the bitcoin sent to this uh, locked account, this group of nodes will or rec automatically recognize the event and what to do uh, in order to create the wrap token uh, on let's say on Ethereum or any other chains, uh, so that uh, uh, you know the wrap token can act as the uh, you know uh, you know real bitcoin because the the real bitcoin uh, they they are locked right so. But for us, uh, the uh, uh, we use this so they are collateralized, right? So uh, we can use, uh, of course, with one coin as a collateral. But in the future, we, we can add uh, other assets as a collateral, right? So that we can build a, a bridge uh, bigger and wider, so that they can hold more uh, bitcoins. Uh, so w with our solution, even the you know Bitcoin, this kind of solution with uh, with without. Without the uh, smart contract, we can still do it, right? So all the uh, Bitcoin family uh, blockchains like uh, Litecoin or uh, Bitcoin Cash or all the other Bitcoin family blockchains can be done uh, in the same way. Well, that's actually very interesting, Jack. Um, I'm a little, like, obviously, uh, unfortunately, I don't get to write about one chain too often. So um, I'm a little bit curious so how are for example nodes chosen uh, like are they like very discrete for example just a limited number of nodes or is it like fully decentralized anyone can join and uh, it's there is some kind of voting system yeah so that's a good question because uh, you know uh, originally uh, for each bridge we we kind of uh, one chain the foundation pick uh, those 21 nodes and th those those nodes are pretty much run um, well, majority of the nodes are run by uh, one chain and related parties. Right? We are gradually opening up, right? And uh, currently, we're we're working on this open open up uh, open storming project to let it de fully decentralized. And we will also introduce a delegation mechanism so that uh, when a node is set up with self staking, right, uh, anybody can stake more one coins or any, maybe other assets in the future to this node, so this node can participate, just like a POS, participate in this uh, computation for this uh, one of many nodes. We, we, we have 21 nodes, one of the top nodes to be selected, right? And, and, and of course, every round, we, we, have, we have to cycle through uh, this locked account uh, periodically, so uh, all these nodes can continue to participate and bid uh, for this top list of nodes. And of course, the, there are multiple bridges uh, if they're not selecting on this bridge, they can put this in on uh, other bridges. That's what we're doing. Well, interesting. Um, I mean, uh, it does kind of, is kind of close to the way, for example, the Liquid Federation works. Uh, I mean, it is uh, like ultimately there are very discreet, uh, discrete entities, right? So um, in Liquid, they're kind of, 
um, let's say chosen by the member by the federation itself. Uh, there's no voting system or anything except within the federation. Um, but I wanted to ask John here. Um, do you think that considering that, uh, for example, in the case of Bitcoin, uh, there is this uh, focus on bringing stuff outside of the chain? So, of course, Liquid is a, an example of that. Uh, do you think that Bitcoin may and like uh, chains like that may eventually uh, just introduce this feature of being able to trustlessly bridge assets across chain and uh, kind of solve their issues like that and ju then just rely on the interoperability to carry the Bitcoin name forward, so to speak? Yeah, that's a very, very good question, Andre. Uh, I tend to fall on the lines of... Uh, there being some level of uh, custodial capabilities and features. Uh, I think as mainstream finance moves over more and more, there will be expectations beyond code-based uh, uh, enablement, uh, if you will. So I don't anticipate custodial capabilities just going away. Yes, we will innovate in terms of smart contract development. We will innovate in terms of enabling trustless and additional uh, features there. Uh, but I think uh, it would be somewhat naive to assume that will be the final solution. Uh, as large institutions move into this space, I think they have uh, mental models of how they have done this before and how they anticipate doing this. Uh, so I see a very strong future for innovation with respect to custodial capabilities. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I guess uh, multi-party computation is one of those aspects, as uh, Jack mentioned. Uh, well, um, actually, I wanted to um, go back to Jad because uh, uh, there, there was this question that I kind of wanted to elaborate on, which uh, you said that smart contract based solutions are not really ideal. Uh, so uh, can you explain why, like uh, what are the fundamental challenges you see with them and uh, solutions like TBTC, for example, and these kinds of bridges? Oh, I, I don't mean that they're not ideal. I just mean that, like, actually, if you, like, dig in a little bit, they're not as decentralized as people to say, just because they said smart contract. I mean, I, I mean, not, I mean, for instance, the, the, the thing that Jack was just pointing out, I mean, there's, there's 21 nodes that sound like they're basically all run by WAN chain that can, that, at the end of the day, have the secret key to this, this thing that's locked up in a smart contract, but it's kind of irrelevant that it's done in this fancy way rather than just done blatantly custodially. Like, and not, not that that's bad, but that's just kind of the way it is, right? And I think often, it, it, not just in, in interoperability, but lots of aspects of, of uh, projects in crypto, they, they like bury, uh, they bury the, like things in, in this concept of smart contracts when it's actually at the end of the day, you, you might as well just, it might as well just be custodial or it's, it's actually not like making it decentralized. Uh, if, I'm not being that clear, but um, that's kind of what I meant. Yeah, for, for sure. Well, um, I guess that actually kind of opens the debate. So um, do you think that, um, so what is decentralization in general? Like, uh, um, what would make a smart contract decentralized in this case? And uh, can that be kind of um, applied to have an interoperability standard, for example? So like, uh, can we make this uh, process as decentralized as possible and how? Yeah, I, I mean, like decentralization is obviously a spectrum, right? I mean, you know, it's it's probably it's better to have your key split amongst like 20, 20 nodes that that maybe don't have the same controller than just have one controller, right? But that's not completely decentralized. You still have to trust those twenty people, for instance. Uh, you know, it, it's it's kind of like a slider. Like you, you want it to be as decentralized as possible, but there's always trade offs. Like the more decentralized it is, the the technically harder and usually like scales less well and, and you know is less efficient you've got to have to find the sweet spot between actually being useful for people and, and being uh you know safe and open so yeah for sure and uh, here i wanted to actually move to to john because uh, obviously you guys are uh, really focused on neo 3.0 right now so uh, and Neo2 kind of has the similar structure where nodes are very discrete and they're not really um, like it's, you know, just as most uh, proof of stake systems uh, with validators. So do you think that this is uh, kind of something that you want to solve with Neo3.0? Like, do you think that uh, the more nodes there are, the more participants there are and the smaller there are, they are, is that better? Yeah, so I, I was not going to bring up the topic of marketing Neo in this session, but since you bring it up, <laughs> uh, I will say 
so decentralization is obviously a means to an end. Uh, and uh, yes, we have a ways to go in terms of enabling it. But also to your other point around interoperability, I think uh, we seem to agree uh, it's not going to be one project or one chain or one solution. It's going to be decentralized emergence of standards uh, in the organizations like the Interwork Alliance that will enable interoperability at scale. Uh, and back to your first point, yes, uh, it's a journey for us in terms of the evolution of building a platform for digital assets. We are not building a platform for everything under the sun. It's a platform for you know, asset digitization. Uh, and secondly, we are very focused on building uh, what I think of as the best in the industry, developer tooling and experience. Uh, you know, there are 21 million developers in the world, Andre. And if you ask people how many developers are working in crypto or blockchain, it's a very small number. And I believe the way we get this is not by forcing developers to come and play by our rules, but rather by us going to where they are, giving them the tools, the frameworks, and the libraries they're used to and they love and enjoy, and make it fun, productive, and friction-free. So for example, on Neo, you can build, deploy, test, deploy, you know, the whole thing in about five minutes, build a simple smart contract. It's as simple and as easy as building an Azure function or a Lambda on AWS. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, kind of the point of my question was uh, mostly about what, like, essentially, what is decentralization, right? But uh, speaking about those standards, um, so do you think that it's really correct for um, blockchain to be kind of standardized in this uh, committee way, uh, for example, or um, do you think that eventually the market will simply choose uh, which standard to pick? So as it kind of happened with, for example, ERC20s on Ethereum and uh, a lot of other chains that are uh, uh, using tokens are also using ERC20 compatible standards. So um, how do you think, like, what, what is the best way to evolve this? Do, are there benefits to a committee chosen standard or are there benefits to um, you know, market choosing essentially. So I'll ask this to everyone, but let's start with John for now. Yeah, so uh, very insightful question, Andre. So I argue uh, both will happen because people will attempt to establish de facto on their own standards, you know, chains and such. There will be committees you know, trying to create a facade of some level of uh, standardization. And uh, the market obviously will get to decide and pick and choose the winners. So the way this will work is you will have these fiefdoms of sort of so-called standards, and then you will have the market driving the interoperability and the integration across these uh, fiefdoms, if you will. And that will be the true standards, in my opinion. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, uh, fantastic panel. Thank you, guys. We are waiting. Join us.